give it a second. I can see, yeah, perfect. I can see that. That's brilliant. Um, great. So if you want to take it away uh, as suits you naturally and then um, just come to an end at the end um, and I will jump, I will appear again. Um, uh, and uh, and that will be that, really, if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Just roll my sleeves up and get ready for action. You Perfect, can do the, okay. You can do the audience reactions. Probably not, no. <laughs> exactly. Imagine right. me laughing along. Right. Perfect. Okay. Right, hello, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm going to do over the next few minutes is just tell you a little bit about my new uh, flora called Frustrating Flowers and Puzzling Plants that's available 25% uh, discount if you're a BSPI member. So it's been produced, it's just out, and it's been produced with Jonathan Mitchley and Henry Ford, who you can see there. Jonathan was involved right from the start, and Henry got involved with sort of helping sort of check some of the data. Henry's the sort of... Uh, the, the man behind Ecoflora, if you come across that. So the story of the uh, of the book, if you like, was it started a few years ago in the days before COVID when I was in an education committee. And we did an exercise when we were looking to make sure that we were providing training and education and materials for botanists of, of all different types, trying to sort of think about widening the diversity of people that are involved with society and involved with botany. And we were sort of thinking, uh, the, uh, where are the gaps in the provision? Where where do we need to be providing training and where do we need to be providing help for for, for botanists who are sort of not necessarily sort of mainstream? And one of the things that came very quickly uh, to, to mind was that lots of people interested in, in, uh, in botany uh, don't really get much beyond the, the, the picture books, the wildflower guides that include most of the species, but in a very sort of simple level. And don't give you any more help and guidance with the complicated groups than they do with the easy ones. So it's fine if you want to identify a nettle or a daisy, but very quickly, many of us will know uh, that when you start to look at uh, the British flora, there are certain families and groups uh, that are really difficult to get to grips with. And there's a big leap between the introductory guides and the standard floras like Stace or the specific guides to complex groups like the BSBI handbooks. So they're all fine. But if you were just to stop the average person in the street who might have an interest in wildflowers and started to, to read a little bit of Stace at random to them, they'd think you were talking a different language. It's not very accessible. So the challenge with the, the uh, writing frustrating flowers it was to make the complexity that many are aware of uh, in the British flora, make it accessible to the, the non-expert, to the beginner. But also with the hope that actually many of us more experienced botanists have still got groups and families that we don't do that we, we, we'll get round to next year or when we've got a bit of time or when we're retired. When there are other sort of complex groups, we'll make our excuses and we'll never get round to them. So this uh, Frustrating Flowers is written to be um, an easy way in for the beginner, but also an easy way in for the more experienced botanist who's sort of got one or two blind spots that they might want to go back to. So the approach that I, I, I've taken is to firstly explain the origin of the complexity then to focus on the key characteristics for the particular group and sort of explain what you should be looking at and why, and then to illustrate and uh, describe those characteristics. And in that introductory text, include some anecdotes, because anecdotes always help you sort of remember things and make sort of life a little bit more interesting. I've used multi-access keys and uh, not a completely dumbed down, but a more simplified language than you'd find in Stace. And finally, I've discussed group by group why you might actually want to sort of bother to learn how to identify these things. So let's th talk through each of these six points in turn and put a little bit more flesh on what's involved. 
So the when I set off writing the, the book, I had a good idea about what I was wanting to do and how I was going to do it, but I didn't really have a structure in mind. And as I started to sort of compile the different groups, I realised that they, they roughly came into these five sort of groupings. And I've plagiarised the, uh, the Olympic rings as a, a, a crude Venn diagram just to get across the point that these are not sort of discrete groups and that there's lots of overlaps in the reason for complexity. And so each individual group has got its own little bit of text explaining the background. So we've got groups of uh, families where asexuality is common, things like the, the dandelions and the hieraceums and some of the sorbuses. We've got groups of plants where hybridization is common and species boundaries merge. We've got groups of plants that are rapidly evolving and changing from one species to another or adapting to, to new hosts if they're sort of parasites or hemiparasites. We've got inbreeding families, which have got not much variation within population, but great amounts of variation between them. And then finally, we've got a few successful families that as individual plants are not particularly difficult to identify, but as a group of plants, and the, the one that I picked on there are, are the umbels, if there were only 25 umbels in the British flora, we wouldn't have any problem identifying them. But there are fact that there are 60 or so of these things makes them much more tricky to identify. So I've tried to explain the origin of the complexity and the overlaps uh, and I've done that separately at the introduction to these different five different groups, but then specifically for each particular family that I'm interested in. And hopefully that will pe get people a better understanding of what it is that they're deal with, dealing with. And for each particular group, I've identified the characteristics that you're are most important in helping us identify and tackle those particular groups. And in many cases, I've illustrated them. And in some cases, there are coloured illustrations. And partly because I've just illustrated the feature that, that matters. So we, we're homing in on, on the key things that matter to identification. But also because for the beginning botanist, there's something more reassuring about having images in there uh it, it's comforting and they're nice things let's just admit it hopefully you'll you'll find the images in the book uh, are, are nice illustrations so it's just to make it a more pleasurable experience to 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 use in the introductory text to some anecdotes, some backgrounds often. And because if you've been involved in, in education, and I was lucky enough to be taught by this man, which is John Richards, who's been at the, the BSBI meetings sort of talking to people about dandelions, uh, John will always sort of have a story and a, a little anecdote along with, with every plant. And they're the little hooks which help you remember what it is that you, you're needing to know to be able to identify this particular group. And many of us, as we start our journey as botanists, are lucky enough to have mentors like John Richards, who will sort of guide us through the complexity and will tell us these stories. But if you're not, if you're an isolated botanist in some little uh, village in the, the back of beyond and you don't know any other botanists, then you're missing out on all these stories and anecdotes. So hopefully uh, that, that some of them at least are, are covered in frustrating flowers. And within each section, there are multi-access keys. There are tabular keys. Uh, and I've used simplified language. And there are several advantages to this, particularly with, with groups that have got lots of hybrids. It provides you a fuller picture of, of all the complexity, of all the traits. So you can decide, actually, if I'm looking at everything, the individual plant that I've got in my hand is more like species A than it is like species B. So if it's a hybrid, it's it's probably got a, a lot of genes of species A present. And I also think it's biologically more meaningful than a dichotomous key, because we know that a probably about half the flora of the planet has got hybridization in, in its history. 
And dichotomous keys assume that things evolve in a branching pattern and that genomes never merge again. And we just know that that's, that's not true. So to be able to produce uh, multi-access keys for all the groups, it means that I've had to miss one or two traits that information for all of the species within the group. They just be missing bits of information. And I've missed out some of the more complex bits and I've had to fill in occasionally missing gaps. And there are potentially some sort of trade-offs there between making it more accessible to the beginner and the robustness of the identification process. But that, that's true for, uh, for any sort of... Uh, identification method that you were to use. One thing that I do think is is novel about frustrating flowers and puzzling plants is for each particular group, I've also had a bit of discussion about why it matters. What level of resolution do you need to go to? And what res resolution do other people go to? And why other people want might want finer level of resolution than you are perhaps interested in? And to help inform that discussion, I spent quite a lot of time looking at historically whether our, our ancestors bothered to identify to the same level of resolution as we do today. And that's involved this uh, finding out when these particular taxons were described, but also if in the Welsh language and the Irish and the, and the Scots languages, did our, our ancestors bother to have names for these species? If they recognise the different brambles, for example, as being sort of different enough that they would recommend this one for a pie or that one for uh, for making jam, then you, you, you might think that there's uh, a, a better cultural reason to worry about the level of resolution. Or you might just think it's purely academic or you might just find that it's just for your for own interest to know about the sort of fine level resolution within all the particular groups that we've covered. So puzzling plants will become a gateway drug for the beginner to hardcore botany for some of them. Hopefully uh, it will also help some of us more experienced botanists to go back and fill in the gaps of, of the groups that we've not quite got round to or we've been saving for a, a, a rainy day. Uh, but it might also just help you feel a little bit more rational in the reasons that you've got for not worrying about the rev level of resolution in some of the groups and confirm your previous prejudices about stopping where you, you have done. So finally, I'd just like to say thanks to the many BSBI members and experts on the different groups that have, that have helped in the writing of this book, that have uh, field tested various chapters and I've I've uh, relied on the help of not just experts on the particular groups but also on beginners who are just starting the first first steps along the way uh, of, of their botanical journey so thanks very much everybody for listening and I hope you find the volume uh, worth the investment thank you <laughs>